Thank you, Your Eminence, uh, dear brother bishops, uh, dear priest. Uh, it's a real joy to be with you today. I have already met uh, some of you in this past month, but I hope that uh, there will be other occasion to know each one of you. I found it a little bit difficult not to see you while you are all seeing me. I would like to have met you in person. And as uh, Cardinal Dolan so graciously said, uh, I just introduced briefly. I was an assistant uh, parish priest in my diocese of origin in Italy, Milano. And uh, then I was called to join the diplomatic service. I was sent first in, in Tanzania, in Africa, then called back to the Secretariat of State uh, for many years, nominated Nuncio and sent to the Middle East in Lebanon, where I spent eight years and where I met also uh, Cardinal Dolan visiting the country at the time. From Lebanon, I was uh, transferred to the Philippines, Manila, where one of your clergy now will be my successor. Archbishop uh, Charles Brown. And uh, from Manila, I was sent here in New York. So now you know a little bit uh, better my life. And if you see me in the streets or somewhere else, just uh, approach me and uh, it will be a joy to greet all of you. First of all, I would like to say thank you for your priestly life. It's always more and more difficult to be priest in our times. So thank you for your uh, daily commitment, your uh, renewed yes to the Lord and to the church. And uh, I feel encouraged for this presentation, which make me a little bit nervous because it's the first time I do something similar uh, through Zoom. The readings, the readings of yesterday, Sunday, you preach, all of you. So we have this uh, introduction from uh, the gospel which actually is also quoted in this uh, uh, encyclical. And also last Friday, the first reading of uh, St. Paul to the Ephesian, he said that uh, there is one God and father of all who is over all and through all and in all. So this is the liturgical introduction for this uh, talk today. I prepared a presentation to accompany my remarks. And uh, so I'm now going to share my screen with you so that you can see the presentation. I also want to mention that if you would like to ask any question, which I hope to be able to answer, it depends. At the end of the presentation, you can email them into the question at holycmission.org. You can see that address on your screen now. Overview, Fratelli Tutti, the Holy Father took the title of the new encyclical from St. Francis of Assisi's admonitions to the first Franciscan friars to regard each other and everyone to whom they were sent as humble friars to serve as all brothers and sisters as siblings. Pope Francis, the uh, looks uh, to St. Francis, not only for his radical adherence to Christ, his love for the poor, his gratitude for the environment, and so many other factors for which in 2013, he took the name Francis upon election, but also because Il Poverello expresses the essence of the type of virtues Pope Francis wants to highlight in this encyclical, the virtues of fraternity and social friendship. Toward the end of the document, he references other examples of these virtues, naming Martin Luther King, Mahatma Gandhi, Desmond Tutu, and the blessed Charles de Foucault, the inspirer of the Jesu Caritas movement to which so many priests across the world belong in order to grow in priestly fraternity and mutual support. Pope Francis said that the audience to whom he was writing was all people of goodwill. He was seeking to engage the whole world in dialogue. The choice 
obviously impacts the literary style of the encyclical. It's going to feature far less ecclesiastical terminology and biblical cita citations, for example, than a typical encyclical written to members of the Catholic household. He said in this encyclica, he wanted to develop various of the important themes that he and the Grand Imam of Cairo, Al Azhar University, Ahmad Al Tayeb, put together in their document on human fraternity for war, peace, and living together, signed in Abu Dhabi in February 2019. By expanding upon those ideas in an encyclical, Pope Francis was not only bringing them to the greater attention of Catholics but also expanding upon them to all peoples throughout the world. Pope Francis admitted that in Fratelli Tutti, he was not intending to give an exhaustive presentation on fraternal love, but what he wanted to do was to describe and help to engender a new vision of fraternity and social friendship that we respond to a situation in which so many are forgotten ignore or even eliminate it. He said with hope that one of the goods that he believes God has been bringing out of the disruption and death of the COVID-19 pandemic has been a renewed sense that we are all in this together. As he said at the United Nations in a video message a month ago, we never emerge from a crisis just as we were. We come out either better or worse. And this encyclical written in the midst of the pandemic is a contribution to help us all come out better. The structure of the encyclical is basically broken down into 10 parts. An introduction, eight chapters, and then two prayers at the end, one to the creator and another ecumenical to God, the Trinity. The chapters begin with the state of the world, then with a beautiful reflection on the parable of the Good Samaritan. Then in chapter three, Pope Francis tries to sketch a vision based on the lessons Christ teaches us in the parable. And in chapter four, applies those lessons to those people migrants and refugees who are making a journey like the men marked on the road to Jerusalem to Jericho, sometimes suffering similar attacks. In the fifth chapter, the Holy Father describes his vision for a better kind of politics, one in which a particular form of charity is at work at the local, national, regional, and international levels. In chapter six, Pope Francis talks about dialogue and friendship and the culture of encounter. In chapter seven, he talks about healing the wounds of those who have suffered tremendous injustice and sketches the path of peace in moving away from a mentality of retaliation to one of justice, memory forgiveness, and reconciliation. And in the final chapter, the Holy Father talks specifically about the role of religions and religious leaders in setting an example, not just for adherents, but for the whole world of the type of fraternity and social friendship the world needs. So that's our itinerary this afternoon. But I would like to begin with what I think is the heart of the entire encyclical, chapter two, where Pope Francis discusses Jesus' famous parable of the Good Samaritan and applies the lessons, not just to our own individual hearts, but to the international relations in terms of how we care for those who are suffering. Through his papacy, in fact, since he addressed Cardinal Dolan and the other cardinals assembled in Rome in the days before the 2013 conclave, Pope Francis has been urging the church to go out into the peripheries of existence and to care for those who are left behind, suffering, even dying without anyone much noticing 
or caring. He has sought to awaken the church to our vocation and mission as our brothers and our sisters keepers. He wants to help us all to see that just like Cain was responsible for his brother Abel, so we are the responsible for our brothers and sisters in need across the world. Their innocent blood shed, their sufferings cry out to heaven, and God has given us ears to hear their cries too. We all know the parable of the Good Samaritan very well, preaching on it in Lent and at daily mass each year, and year C, like we have this year, at Sunday mass as well. Pope Francis links it first to Jesus' words in the Sermon of the Mount about the golden rule, doing to others what we would want done to us. If we were ever mugged and left for dead, every one of us would hope people would come to help us. If we were in abject poverty, we would hope someone would send aid. If we were forced to flee because of violence or poverty, we would like somebody not slam the door or put impenetrable fences. Likewise, he links the parable to Jesus' words about the general judgment that he'll separate us like sheep and goats into two groups on the basis of our care for him in the disguise of the hungry, thirsty, naked, stranger, ill, or imprisoned. The fathers of the church, as you know, interpreted the parable by saying Jesus is the good Samaritan. We are the victim and the church is the inn. When Jesus tell us go and do the same, he's not only tell us to pay his charity forward, but he's making it even easier, saying that whatever we do to our most need brother or sister, he will take personally. Pope Francis says, that in contrast to a globalized indifference, God wants us truly to care for each other, to open our hearts and take time to care for the suffering and the abandon we meet. He says very powerfully, and I quote, there are only two kinds of people, those who care for someone who is hurting and those who pass by. Each day, he adds, we have to decide whether to be good Samaritans or indifferent bystanders. The Holy Father apply these lessons to the economic, political, social, and macro-religious spheres. The decision to include or exclude those lying along the roadside, he says, can serve as a criterion for judging the actions taken at all these levels. Many of us, and many of our leaders, he says, however, act is as if they're unaware of the parable. So many are living in what he calls a desolate byway, where everyone ignores them and passes them by. When we do, he says, we become secret allies of the bandits, like those who attack the men in the parable. We allow the thieves to get away with their evil and do nothing for the victim. Even religious believers can behave this way, he added. The response is for us to become a neighbor, to recognize that the whole world is our neighborhood and to draw near to those who need the help we can provide. Once we recognize that we are called to be neighbor to everyone in need, then we can progress to being a true brother or sister as well. I would like to highlight a few final points about chapter two. Pope Francis says that we should not overlook that Jesus mentioned that the one who came to the aid of the presumably Jewish victim was a Samaritan, a foreigner, someone with whom the Jews had centuries of animosity. This detail shows us that concern must transcend boundaries or prejudices. He also stressed the importance of working together. The Samaritan couldn't do it all on his own, but together with innkeeper, 
he could give the victim a chance. Likewise, at every level, there is a need to respond to those in need in a coordinated fashion with all organically doing their part. There are also some words for those of us who have the privilege to preach and teach. The Pope is asking us to preach more directly and clearly about our social nature made in the image of God who is communion of persons, about the fraternal dimension of our spirituality that we pray not my father, but our father, about the inalienable dignity of every person, including those who most often have their dignity denied in theory or in practice, about how we are called to love and accept all our brothers and sisters because Christ does not give any exceptions to those whom he calls us to love. Chapter one. Let's turn now briefly to the individual chapters to see how they cohere with Pope Francis' vision of the Good Samaritan. In chapter one, Pope Francis describes the many dark clouds that impede universal fraternity. He mentions so many, from war to polarization, consumerism, modern slavery, abortion, euthanasia, racism, unemployment, poverty. All of these troubling phenomena, he says, have made it harder for us to relate to each other as brothers, as members of the same family. We objectify others and their problems. They become a them rather than an us. Pope Francis says that the pandemic, thankfully, has momentarily revived a familiar, a familiar sense when we see how a tiny virus in one part of the world can stop the rest of it and how the collective efforts of people throughout the world are necessary to respond to it. The Pope specifically cited the valor of so many of the heroes of the pandemic as examples. I know some of you who are among those heroes in your care for the sick in hospitals. Thank you for putting the parable into practice in that way that made every priest so proud to be numbered with you. We turn now to chapter three, where Pope Francis begins to outline a worldview where we cross the road moved by compassion, fraternity, and friendship. He mentions several virtues that are needed, self-sacrificial love, sincerity, hospitality, solidarity, cooperation, responsibility, and benevolence. Our spiritual stature, he says, is really measured by our love, how we seek others' good for their own sake. He introduces the term of social friendship and says that this is a friendship that transcends borders, whether national borders or other classification that can occasionally divide people. Just as the Samaritan care for a wounded Jew, so we are called to care for everyone, including, as Dora today used to say, those we like the least. The problem today, Pope Francis says, is that many don't want to treat people as neighbors or brothers. The most they are willing to do is to treat them as partners or associates. These are transactional terms taken from business. Pope Francis is calling us to more. In what to me seems like a clear outreach to the daughters and sons of the Enlightenment, Pope Francis mentioned liberté, égalité, fraternité, the battle cry of the French Revolution, before saying that we only have true freedom and equality when we have, we have a genuine fraternity based on the dignity of each person. Part of another's dignity is the recognition of a common creator and therefore of our mutual kinship. Pope Francis also mentioned in this chapter that economics, 
must be centered on the good of persons and the common good. It must be at the service of people rather than force people to be at its service. He mentions the traditional Catholic teaching of the universal destination of created goods, together with the principle of private property, mentioning that this pertains not just to individuals, but to countries. He also describes how we are all summoned to be stewards of our common home, part of fraternity, as many of us learned growing up, is to care for our house. All of this, Pope Francis said, for an alternative way of thinking. He was trying to help us to think that way in this section. In chapter four, Pope Francis turns to what he calls the complex challenges arising when our neighbor is an immigrant. The response to those who are refugees, migrants, or internally displaced must be, he said, gratuitous, not utilitarianism. The generosity is seen, he said, in how we welcome, protect, promote, and integrate those who have, for one reason or another, felt the need to leave their home and native place. And these are the four main uh, verbs, welcome, protect, promote, and integrate. Pope Francis summarizes in his chapter the basic human rights that always have to be met with regard to food, basic medical care, family unity, adequate documentation, religious freedom, and education for children. Care for those in need in this way also enriches the caregiver because love always enriches. He says that helping those in this situation is likewise good for one's own country, not only because of all of the creativity and industry they bring, but also because it alleviates what could become a problem down the road since poverty is a breeding ground for terrorism, revolution, and other social phenomena. Pope Francis likewise mentioned that there is a tension between caring for our more proximate neighbors, what he called localization, and caring for people all across the world, what he terms globalization. The goal, he says, is to have a healthy sense of neighborhood in one's local and then take that to other relationships. In the fifth chapter, Pope Francis described a better kind of politics truly at the service of the common good. Without the political realm, there is no chance for universal fraternity, social friendship, and peace. He describes politics as a lofty vocation and one of the highest forms of charity, because it seeks not just the individual good of another, but the common good. It summons those in politics to what it calls political love in contrast to pursuit of power. Political love means genuinely caring for the good of others and working for it. Without political love so understood, he said it will be impossible to form a civilization of love. Not every politician, of course, behaves this way, or like the statements of St. Thomas More on the slide. He says, populist politicians are those who manipulate popular sentiment to the short-term advantage of certain segments of the population, rather than everyone leading to a greater polarization. He contrasts populist politicians with popular movements and their leaders saying that popular movements really do care about the people and are essential for democracy. In this paragraph, Pope Francis has been developing what he said in various addresses to the popular movements of Latin America over the course of his pontificate. Political love, Pope Francis says, always involves education, which passes this civic love on to the next generation. Subsidiarity, which allows everyone to serve according to their capacities and help emphasize neighborliness. 
and solidarity, which is the social expression of love. In the sixth chapter, Pope Francis described the nature of dialogue. He speaks often about dialogue, and this is perhaps the most well-developed explanation of what it means and what it doesn't mean. To bring about a social friendship and universal fraternity, we have to bring into a conversation not just of words or ideas, but our lives, those who so often are excluded, forgotten, and have no voice. True dialogue, he says, is not parallel monologues of people tweeting favorably. It's a respectful encounter of those equal in dignity, which involves drawing near, listening, speaking, knowing, understanding, and finding agreement. When there is lack of dialogue, he says, quietly perceptively, it shows that people are more interested in power than cooperation. In a very important part of this chapter, the Holy Father says that true dialogue can't happen without the truth. In Greek, dialogue is dialogos. It's a journey toward the truth, and hence effective dialogue cannot take place in a relativistic context. It must be a consensual search for the truth, which he emphasizes we can know by reason. Without the coordinates of the truth, the interpretation of values will be done by those in power. True dialogue, he adds, often involves some compromise. We mutually give up some non-essentials for the sake of the common good. This is common to every marriage, to every friendship, and is common to the dialogue at the root of social friendship. In chapter seven, and I hope you are still following because it's a little bit heavy, this presentation, but in chapter seven, Pope Francis tackles some of the deepest wounds that plague the world and tries to show the path to heal them so that there is a possibility for universal fraternity, social friendships, and peace. He talks atrocity like the Holocaust, the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and other crimes against humanity that unfortunately still occur today. What's needed in these circumstances is the arduous path of penitential memory, penitential memory, truth, forgiveness, and reconciliation. He gives a very helpful reflection of forgiveness, saying it doesn't involve forgetting or pretending that what one suffered wasn't a big deal. Those who truly forgive do not forget, he writes, but they choose not to heal to the same destructive force that caused them so much suffering. He mentioned two extreme circumstances in which forgiveness is needed and in which often people resort to measures that rather than re remedying the injustice, just add greater destruction. The first is war. He says emphatically, we can no longer think of war as a solution because its risk will probably always be greater than its supposed benefits. He even says that it's difficult to uphold any longer the possibility of a just war since war always brings so much attendant destruction. The second extreme situation involves the death penalty, something about which he has spoken a great deal during his papacy. He calls the death penalty today inadequate, inadmissible, and no longer necessary, since as John Paul II wrote in Evangelium Vitae, it is possible to render aggressor incapable of committing further harm by bloodless means. Pope Francis also described the various practical issues for his prudential judgment, such as judicial error or the misuse of the death penalty by dictatorial regimes. But the main reason he stresses its inadmissibility 
is because of the need to manifest a genuine reverence for the dignity of every human life. Not even the murderer loses his dignity, he says. And that point is made when we make the decision not to take the life of someone whom we must regard as a brother and sister. In the final chapter, Pope Francis focuses on the special role of religious leaders and religions in the building social friendship and universal fraternity. Because of our faith in God, the creator, we look at creatures differently. We look at human dignity differently. Although some secularists try to prevent religious leaders and believers from engaging in the public square, love of neighbor must draw believers to cross the road into the square. We can't love our neighbor otherwise. Pope Francis emphasizes that religious believers can teach everyone how to dialogue. If we can still love each other, even if we disagree about some of the most important and deepest truth, we set an example for those in political, social, educational, and other spheres. Pope Francis says that when we worship God, we grow in our awareness of the sacredness of every human life. When we love our neighbor, we transcend xenophobia, terrorists, or the denial of the right to religious freedom. As religious leaders, he said, we are called to be true people of dialogue, authentic mediators and artisans of peace. That's a call to each, uh, uh, to each us all. This is the presentation. And uh, there are some questions raised about the encyclical in the press these days. But before we do, I'd like to finish the talk by praying together the Trinitarian prayer Pope Francis gave us at the end of Fratelli Tutti. O oh God, Trinity of love, from the profound communion of your divine life, pour out upon us a torrent of fraternal love. Grant us the love reflected in the actions of Jesus, in his family of Nazareth, and in the early Christian community. Grant that we Christians may live the gospel, discovering Christ in each human being, recognizing him crucified in the sufferings of the abandoned and forgotten of our world and reason in each brother or sister who makes a new start. Come, Holy Spirit, show us your beauty reflected in all the peoples of the earth so that we may discover anew that all are important and all are necessary. Different faces of the one humanity that God so loves. Amen.